That's like you and me. That's how good this team is. Hey guys, welcome back to RBR. We're finally back after a one month hiatus over Christmas and the new year. And you'll notice as you continue watching this video and indeed from the opening sequence, that we've changed the look and feel of the channel and some of the tech and the background stuff behind it. So it's not gone to waste. But one month was far too long for me personally not to be reviewing cars. So when BMW UK contacted me and said the brand new 8 Series was ready to test, I was literally chomping at the bit to sink my teeth into something. And surprisingly, this has been the most commented car by you guys on both YouTube and Instagram for us to cover. So let's get straight to it. Now it's ironic that the first car that Mr. AMG tests in the new year is Munich's new flagship, the 8 Series. But I know what you're thinking. Surely, even though it's called an 8, this is just the new 6 Series Coupe, right? But the thing is, it's not as simple as a simple badge rename on the back. Now, if I had said 8 Series to you prior to this car, you would have thought of this, the original E31 8 Series. And why not? Now it's pretty much a design legend in the car industry, isn't it? But you see, prior to this 8 Series coming into production, there was another car that just ended production at that time, and that was the E24 6 Series Coupe, like this one here, the 635 CSI. What a gorgeous car. So about the time this car ended production, the 8 Series started. And it's much of a similar story now in the present. The current 6 Series, or the outgoing one rather, is much more of a 5 Series coupe using much of the same architecture, technology, engines. And indeed, its size and shape and position in the market in terms of pricing is very much reflective of that. But you see, just like back then, the new 8 Series is aiming for a higher market and a different customer base. BMW refer to it as a sports car rather than a GT, and their goal was thrilling driving dynamics. And they're doing this by putting their best tech into this car, with regards to body, powertrain, suspension, all to make the car as precise, as agile, and as fun to drive, as much of a sports car as possible. And indeed, just the shape of the car begins to show you these telltale signs. So if you look at the outgoing 6 Series, compared to the 8, the 8 is actually a shorter car. And that should surprise you because 9 out of 10 replacement modern cars are always, always growing in size. And we've moaned about this on the channel for new cars many, many times. And that's not the case here. That's the first indicator to you that this is not a direct replacement of the 6 Series. One way it is bigger than the 6 though is the width. This is a much wider car, it sits much lower. As we said, it's shorter and it becomes sharper and sharper, especially that raked roof line as you get to the back of the car. And then the overall look of it to me is more of a GT car, something a lot more like an Aston DB11. I'm not looking at this and thinking S-Class Coupe because it just seems smaller and more compact and more sharp. I'm not looking at it and thinking 911 either because it's just bigger than that but yeah about the db11 type size i'm thinking even though bmw want to refer to this as a sports car to my eyes it's a gt now we said that they're using their best technology so the body and white of this car uses munich's new cluster architecture platform and the body consists of steel reinforced lightweight aluminium and even carbon fiber reinforced plastic at the core which makes this car then, if you compare it to say the Astons, the S-Classes, etc., the lightest of the bunch. And it also makes it more rigid, all going towards that idea of being a lot more sports car than the other, just like the ultimate driving machine should be. It also gets a unique engine in the M850i, which is a V8 twin turbo producing 530 brake horsepower. All cars across the range also get rear wheel steering. And for the first time in a non-M car, you can spec a carbon roof. And then you get to the design. To my eyes, it's a really pretty looking car because I like GTs and I like cars with big grills because I'm an AMG fanatic. So a big grill like this is obviously gonna make me happy. I do think there's a little bit of grill envy going on in Munich at the moment though, don't you? Now many people, myself included, hope for a return to the styling of the original 8 series. 
But come to think of it, that might have been quite polarizing in today's market. So instead, I think I kind of understand where BMW's designers were going with this. They've made this car their flagship model and they want it to exude everything that they think is important about the brand. And I think that includes the styling. So what they've done here, they've over-exaggerated all of the typical BMW design traits in one car. So the grill, yes, you've got gigantic kidney grills. They're over-exaggerated. Even the front badge here is probably the biggest I've ever seen on a BMW. Then you look at the bonnet, it's really sculpted, over-exaggerated, it's long, it's massive. It's not like anything you'll see on any other BMW. You look at the gorgeous lights, they're the slimmest and longest, again, that I've seen on a BMW. Inside, of course, you've got the wonderful laser, laser light technology, which is about 1800, but pretty much worth it, I think. It really lights up the road well. You carry across to the wing and you've got the most exaggerated feature here of this duct on the side. It's the biggest, again, that you'll see in any BMW. And then the shape of the car, it slims as it gets to the middle. And then you see the rackish roof line and it sharpens and sharpens and sharpens till you get a small Hofmeister kink as is so key in the modern BMW. You see the roof as well and it's got a dip in the middle. Again, good aerodynamics there. And the rear, again, typical design features, over-exaggerated and larger than you've ever seen on any of their other cars. Just look at those exhausts. They are easily the biggest I've seen on any BMW, maybe any GT car, just period. They're huge. And then the lights very much like the current 3 Series, but longer, bigger. You're getting the idea now. So it's over-exaggerated all of those design elements into a really pretty looking GT car in my opinion. Overall, the rear is my absolute favorite part and that is the part that looks the most GT to me. It's really nicely sculpted and it's got a lot of aggression to it. So the car sits lower than the 6 Series. It's shorter, it's wider, it's got more exaggerated styling. It's got tech that the 5 Series doesn't have and the 6 Series didn't have. So okay, maybe it is aiming at a higher end of the market. Certainly the price is being about 15K more. But then the question is, when you look at a 100K M850i, do you think this car looks special enough to go up against things like the Astons and the Bentleys and the S Coupes or a 911? And for that, I wanna hear from you guys in the comments. So the one that we're testing today is the 840D. And of course there is the M850i, which looks like this. You're expecting some magic. There's no need because they're both identical. Yep, you cannot tell the cars apart. And I will get onto why I decided to test the diesel as opposed to the M850i when we go on the drive. But this is just the beginning as you'd expect for these cars. Pics have already leaked of the top dog, the flagship, which is the BMW M8. Now, of course, you're starting to see things from the M5 in this. It's gonna look pretty aggressive. Unfortunately, it's not got as much as I was hoping from that lovely M8 Grand Coupe concept, but we will get onto that when the M8 itself comes out and hopefully we review it. Of course, there's gonna be a four-door Grand Coupe version of this car as well to go up against the GT63S, AMG, the Porsche Panamera, etc. So exciting times ahead in the 8 Series. I think it's a really good start, certainly design-wise. Next to the M2 Comp, this is my favorite BMW in terms of looks. But now let's go inside because the inside is very important in this car. Where the outside takes nothing from that old 8 series, the inside seems almost obsessed with the past. So as soon as you get in this car, very, very plush. But as I said, if you've seen the old 8 series, you will begin to recognize the shape of this immediately. So let me show you as the first port of call, just how similar the structure of this car is to that car. Really reminds me of, if you remember our G-Wagon review, how obsessed Mercedes were over copying the original G. That's how obsessed BMW seemed to be with copying the original structure of the interior, especially that center console, the driver's zone itself with the area that encases the speedo rather. And even the way that the trim of the door connects to the rest of the car really seems similar to that car. And indeed the seating structure, you've got very much occasional seats in the rear, which we'll get to later. But all of this very reminiscent of the original 8 Series. So it's nice to see some part of that heritage come into this car. However, 
whether you think this in its entirety looks special enough is down to you. I think BMW fans will be quite pleased with it. I do think the new X5 and the X7 are better looking inside in terms of a luxurious interior. But then I would have been unhappy without having some kind of link to the original H series in this car. So the first thing you notice is the new digital screen in the driver's zone. Now, it's an interesting one, this, because it's great that BMW have finally come into full digital screens, but it very much feels like a beta version when you first start using it. So unlike what you guys will be used to on our channel from the MB and the AMG ones, where you can change pretty much everything on the screen. You've got three, four, five different designs sometimes. And then even within those designs, you can change different parts of the screen with different information. With this, you've got a lovely initial screen, but you can't change it. So you get the speedo on the left-hand side, the rev counter, which is very difficult to read as you're driving. You have to rely on the heads up instead on the right. Um, and you can't change those at all. And in the middle, even more bizarre, you get permanent navigation maps in the middle as well. And you can't change any of that information. The only time this area changes is if you go into sport mode, then you get nice M dials in the same shape. And that's the only change you get. Um, I'd liken it to something like when Audi originally started doing digi displays. It's kind of like that, you know, one design, very fixated on one thing, which is a shame because the shape of the screen and everything would allow for more. And I hope it's something that they do in the future, because if you don't like or find this one a bit unreadable, you should be able to have different designs to go to. Then of course you get the steering wheel. Now I'm very well acquainted with this one. This is out of the new M5, and this comes part of the M Sport Technic pack, which is about two and a half thousand pounds, but it's well worth it because you get this M steering wheel, you get the M differential in the rear, you get the M Sport brakes, you get headlining in Alcantara as well and even the lovely M seat belts that we have in the M2 Comp and the M5. So well worth spending that little bit to get all these extra bits. But as far as the steering wheel goes, as I said in the M5 review, to me, it looks like something I would expect in an X7 or a 7 Series. It's too fat. There's no squared off bottom section for an M steering wheel. It just looks too chunky and too luxury to be considered sporty. Of course, the BMW operating system has been majorly updated as well. I found it quite a struggle to get to terms with. I was very much used to the previous iDrive systems, such as in the M4 CS and the new M2 Comp, but this one is very different and it's taken me a long time. I still don't quite, it, there's no logical way to kind of navigate it if you're not familiar with it. You would need a proper, proper handover to get to terms with it. But I tend to use Apple CarPlay, which is works really well on this because it's a touch screen, unlike a lot of the other uh, rivals in this segment. And it works really well. You've got Google Maps and Waze now finally and Apple CarPlay um, and Android Auto as well. And I've used that as my default thing. So the screen is also nice and big, so you're not gonna have any screen envy coming out of a Mercedes and into this car. Of course, it's got ambient lighting in all the right places and you can switch between numerous colors now and it really does make the car look special, especially at night. The other thing is when you sit in here, you're sitting really quite low. And it reminds me a lot of kind of the, the Aston DB11 or even a little bit of the AMG GTS where you feel like you're in a sports car, you're sitting really quite low and the seats, the seats are brilliant in this car. They are so comfortable for long distance cruising and for sporty driving, they hug you really well and they look fantastic in this Merino leather. Even in the back, they look really well sculpted. And then when you turn on the heated seats, they heat up so quickly, first of all, but the armrests here and here both heat up again really quickly. And in really cold weather like today, you really get toasty quite quick. And then you've got heated steering wheel in this car. So I really like this, especially in the UK at this time of year and in Germany, I know it's snowing, brilliant. Of course, you've got the new BMW digital key, which is absolutely ginormous. I mean, look at it compared to my iPhone X, X, XS Max rather. Um, yeah, it's big. And I think you do get a normal key as well. It is useful in the sense that you can like get the car pre-warmed up and ready for you to jump in, etc. And there's a few other features, but I'm sure that's all available in BMW Connected Drive's app anyway. Um, I feel it's a bit of a gimmick, but one good thing, you have got a wireless charging mat here. So while you're driving, you can constantly charge the key and not have to worry about charging in any other manner. 
And of course it'll charge your phones as well in that same wireless map. I love the 360 camera in this car because it gives you such an accurate view of what's around you. And then you can play around and see all the environment and twist the car. It's a little toy, it's, it looks awesome. It's quite the party trick, but it's very useful because this is a big car, it's a wide car as we said. So having 360 cam is really, really necessary. One thing I must absolutely advise you to get if you're a buyer is the steering and the driving assistance in this car. Because this is such a good luxury cruise, and I'll talk about that later, the way that it just allows you to relax in the car by having those safety systems engaged, by driving itself for a little bit of the time, it really adds to the experience of this as a GT car. So if you can, I would definitely go for those options. Now, the other bit that is quite controversial in newer luxury BMWs is what you'll see right here in the gear stick when you get in the car. And it's an option called Crafted Clarity. It costs 500 pounds and you get this almost like the gem that you would find in an old English chandelier as your gear knob. Inside you'll see the lighted eight logo, which is actually the best part of this particular option, but it carries across onto like the engine start stop button, the control knob for the system, the volume knob here. And it's all this kind of diamond shape. Now I've shown quite a few people. I've had mixed opinions. My own opinion was when I first saw it, I didn't like it. As I've lived with it, I've seen the lighted eight logo. That's kind of sold me on the whole thing. And I think I'd find it weird looking at an eight that doesn't have it. And I'll show you what that looks like now. Apart from that, this is an interior that BMW fans will probably like. But for the rest of us, when you're looking at this car up against the absolutely gorgeous interior of the new S Coupe, this isn't anywhere near to that level. It's nowhere near to the Bentley level. Um, if anything, it's quite similar to the DB11, but again, it kind of looks like a downgraded version of that. Don't get me wrong, the whole way it's trimmed with Alcantara and beautiful Napa leather, etc., it's great. But there's a lot of use of kind of matte chrome here, and the whole structure just generally, it's the same structure you'd find in, a, in an M2 or, a, or an X2. It, it's that whole middle section that looks exactly the same in all BMWs pointing towards the driver, same driver, zone, etc. You know, same side on the passenger side as well. It all starts to meld together into one interior across the brand. And you just want something a bit outlandish in the 8 Series as the, flag, as the flagship, I find. But again, I come back to that point that it needed something to link to the 8 Series. Now, one part of this car that a lot of people have mentioned is that the rear seats are almost unusable. Because the car is now shorter, you actually get less space in the rear here than you would in the equivalent six series. Indeed, you sit in something like the M2 and you've got a lot more rear space than you'd have in this car. So it's an odd one, but this is more occasional seating kind of, again, I keep saying it like the DB11. I think you've got a lot more than you'd have in the 911 and nowhere near as much as you have in the S-Class Coupe. And a lot of people say that you can't even fit your kids in. Well, luckily I have a special helper who's gonna help me prove that you can fit a child in here. As you can see, this young man is pretty comfortable in the back. He's just about to turn nine and it seems okay for someone around about that age, anything older or bigger, and you're gonna be pushing it. Now, normally this is the point in these reviews that I would show you what the car sounds like on start up and revs, but because this is a diesel, I'm not gonna do that. But what I am gonna show you is what the M850i sounds like. Now it's time to go for a drive and I want to explain to you off the bat why it was the 840D that I chose to review. So on Instagram, one of the questions I got asked immediately when I shared the fact that our first review is gonna be of the 840D was that, Raz, why didn't you review the M850i instead? Now, of course, that is quite the monster, that car. It's a V8 twin turbo, it produces 523 brake horsepower from that N63 um, BMW V8. It's got 750 Newton meters of torque, so a smidge more than this car. Obviously, all the uh, attraction that is there for a petrol head in a petrol car as opposed to a diesel one. And of course, the number that everyone throws around most for the M850i is the zero to 60 of 3.7 seconds. 
which is significant. That is like DB11 AMG GT quick. But to me, the flaws of the M850i become apparent when you see just how much good that this 840D shares with it. And for you Merc fans especially, you're gonna have to rejig your brains a little. So whereas in Mercedes, we're used to having two completely separate branches. You've got one Mercedes-Benz, which are absolutely dedicated to making good luxury cars that are comfortable. That is the prime objective. And then you've got AMG, who take in that comfort element, but are obsessed with driving performance, especially in modern AMG. So you've got two very distinct brands there. And with Mercedes-Benz, you don't really find that driving dynamics, especially in the diesel, are very high up their priority list. That is not the case at BMW. BMW's ethos is that of the ultimate driving machine. And that carries across into cars like this 840D, like the 40D and the 50D version of the X5, all of the diesel three series as well. You find that they're such good driving cars, but they're not M cars as such. So when you come to this 840D, it's got that ultimate driving machine ethos from the get-go. So let's see first, what does it share with the M850i? But as you'll see, it's almost a case of what doesn't it share? So it's got the same suspension setup. You've got a multi-link rear suspension and double wishbone front, and you've got the active steering that the M850i has as well. And you've even got the rear wheel steering that that car has to boot. You've got the same BMW X-Drive system. You've even got the same torque converter eight-speed gearbox in this car as the M850i with the same ratios. If you get the M Sport Technic pack that we mentioned earlier, then you also get the M Sport upgraded brakes. You get the M differential in the rear. You get this M steering wheel and a host of other options, which is well worth it for two and a half grand. You even get the option of a carbon fiber roof for the first time in a non-M car. So yes, the main difference then is the engine. The rest of the car is pretty much nigh identical. So let's talk about the engine then. This is a three liter twin turbo diesel. And the first figure that I wanna tell you is the most important with this one is the torque figure. You get 680 Newton meters of torque out of this diesel engine. And that is the real punch and the force that you feel in any of these cars. So where the, where the petrol is 750, at 680 you're getting almost the same amount of that pulling power that you feel here in the driver's seat. And it's a brilliant turbo engine. I can barely feel any lag from this thing. And then of course it's paired, as I said, to that eight speed torque converter, which is again a familiar gearbox that A, we have in the M850i as I said, but you also get it in the new M5. And it seldom misses a beat, this gearbox. It's really, really good. And then you hear the engine itself and it sounds purposeful. I've always kind of lauded Porsche diesels, which are now unfortunately extinct for having a wonderful sound and not sounding diesel-like at all. And this is the next car I think since then that it just doesn't sound like a diesel. And then you pair the handling that you get from this car with that and you just lose sight of the fact that you're actually in a diesel car. It's brilliant. I cannot remember any other diesel apart from those Porsche ones, which pairs such a sporty chassis with an engine like this that sounds so refined. And then you lose the fact that you're actually in a diesel car. It's a great feeling to have because you still get all the benefits of a diesel. Yeah, it's only 320 brake horsepower, but that's not the figure I want you to concentrate on because you still get a zero to 60 in about four and a half seconds. And it's that torque figure. It's the torque figure of 680 that you really feel. And in day-to-day -day driving, this car feels really quick. The handling is interesting. Now this car is 100 kg lighter than the equivalent S Coupe. Well, there is no equivalent in terms of diesel, but if we look at the S500, for example, and that's including the added X drive, which of course adds weight compared to the rear wheel drive S class. And it does feel it. It does feel a lot more nimble than the S class. And you can see kind of why BMW want to refer to this thing as a sports car rather than a GT. And if anything, it kind of gives me similar vibes to the DB11 that we drove. Um, steering is a mixed bag. 
The rear wheel steer, as you guys know, I'm a big fan of and I'm very used to it from the AMG GTR. Um, but in terms of the feedback, let me explain to you guys what journalists mean when they go on about feedback. So essentially this car steers really well, but you kind of realize that after you've turned. So you don't get the feeling of how much it's going to steer until it's done so. And when you're driving faster on these kinds of roads, that's when that can be a little bit unsettling and you lose a bit of confidence. Because you're forever trying to second guess how much the car is gonna steer. And that's what we mean by feedback. So you're lacking it a bit in this car and then you're constantly kind of correcting yourself to get it right. So it's nothing like the brilliant M2 comp steering, but quite similar perhaps to the M5, which again, I didn't think the steering feedback was great on that car. But just the fact that I'm comparing it to other M cars, it baffles my Mercedes brain, because I would never do that with a Mercedes diesel. And that's how good, I'm trying to impart this to you guys, that's how good these diesel BMWs are. They are genuinely proper driving cars. So when you buy a car like this, you're buying it to be a daily. And to discover that the handling is quite fun on small A and B roads is a great bonus to have in a car that looks sporty as well. But then if we shift it back into comfort mode, the benefit of this diesel is that it does that whole GT thing so, so well. The suspension is a little bit more forgiving than the M850i. It still sits on the same steels and it's nothing as wafty and as comfortable as say the S Coupe or the Bentley equivalents. But I'd say it's a much more comfortable daily than the DB11. And you could just see yourself chewing miles and miles and miles in pretty much utter comfort. You chuck on the driving assistant self-drive here and you're literally just pampered. It's a really, really great car for chewing up miles. But that's not all because this is also, of course, X-Drive, as I said, which means this is an all weather car, an all year round car, unlike say the DB11 or our UK S Coupes, which none of which have formatic. So this is a much more viable car to use all year round than those are. But let's try and zero in on this now. I mentioned that it's 25,000 pound cheaper than the M850i. And this is significant, not only because at that 100K mark, the competition is that much tougher from the other rivals and then you compare the engine say with the MB and the AMG versions and things become a little difficult. I'm not even looking at it from that side. I'm looking internally as a BMW customer looking at other BMWs. Things become tougher because at that price range surely you'd be looking at the brilliant M5. I mean why wouldn't you? Or if you really really like the look of this car you'd wait to get a really good deal on the upcoming M8, in my opinion, rather than settling for the M850i. This was a Mercedes, as you guys know, I'm a sound junkie. I'd be telling you to go for the V8 because of how good those engines sound. But apart from revving at a standstill, the M850i doesn't really give you much of a soundtrack. You get something far away in the distance and then some amplification of fake sound from the speakers. But if you look around the market, this diesel two-door has no rivals. Just think about it for a second. There are no rivals to this car. It's low, wide, aggressive two-door with a diesel option. And that's what makes this car so compelling to me. It feels fast because of the torque in that diesel engine and the ultimate driving machine portion, which is the most important, I think, to a BMW driver is intact from the M850i. But this car will give you five to 600 miles on a tank. I've been driving it like a hooligan, to be honest, because it's the type of car you really want to drive fast. And I've still only consumed a quarter tank in the last four days. Being that much cheaper, it's gonna take less of a hit on depreciation, I think. And then when you look at the styling, as we said before, it is absolutely identical to the M850i. Heck, if you debadged it, I'm sure no one in Munich could even tell you the difference between this and the petrol version, which is really compelling because what you're looking at then is an identical exterior and interior. All you have to weigh up is which engine you want. So you get all that feel good factor of this sexy GT form, but if you want, you can go for this diesel engine. This car, like all great non-M BMWs, makes me believe 
in the diesel car. I still think it has a place in the market personally and it makes me sad to see that they're going. The M850i works if you are heavily invested in the BMW brand and you really want a petrol version of this car right now because it does the same as this but with a seriously rapid pace. I don't think I'll bring sand into it because it's not really that relevant with that car and you lose a bit of the daily factor but it's still a really good car. But if it were my money, I would be tempted to wait for the M8 if you really want a performance car. If the M5 was anything to judge by, if that gets the same kind of variable MX drive in it, that could be a really, really exciting car. And hopefully it'll have a more interesting engine note like the M5 does. But until then, if you want a really good daily GT that still feels really powerful, and has looks as gorgeous as this car, I don't think you can go wrong with this 840D. And this car is unique in the market, and if you want a sexy BMW GT, you can see how this 840D now, it's a lot more upmarket than the 6 Series that preceded it. So guys, I hope you enjoyed that review on the new 8 Series. Please do like and subscribe as you always do, and I'll see you again soon.